listeners in person and welcome to everybody joining us online as well. Um, I just want to take some time this morning just before we uh, worship and before we uh, listen to the sermon uh, to remind us just how good it is to meet on a Sunday morning uh, and to remind us that it's actually a blessing for us uh, to meet like this um, and to encourage you uh, to rest in the Lord uh, and to worship him. Um, we're going to read from Genesis chapter 2 verse 3 and it'll be on the screen um, and it says God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy for on it he rested from all his work of creation and um, so God declared this day as holy and he rested and um, this means that God set this day apart for himself and it was distinct because there was a measure of rest on this day so God is establishing a pattern in creation even before the law is given to Moses um, and then go with me to Mark chapter 2 verse 27 and this is uh, Jesus speaking uh, the Pharisees have come to him they're plucking grain in the fields um, and the Pharisees aren't very happy and Jesus says the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath so the Pharisees are challenging Jesus because he's using the Sabbath in a way that they disapprove of. And Jesus replies basically that this day was designed as a blessing and not as a burden. Uh, and then finally, follow with me into Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. Just the short first part of verse 25. It says, not neglecting to gather together. Um, this is Paul encouraging us <coughs> to meet together, uh, and this command shouldn't be seen as overbearing, um, but when viewed correctly, uh, it should be seen as good. Paul, under the new covenant, is still encouraging us to meet together, and these meetings are a form of Sabbath for us, uh, and the meetings are um, established, how they look are established all throughout the New Testament. Um, so everything that was true of that seventh day in creation is true of here and now. So this time is holy, it's set apart for the Lord, and this time is intended to establish a form of rest. Uh, so set this time apart this morning, quiet your heart and your mind, and worship. Um, and I think it's good practice to practice this posture <coughs> because it doesn't come naturally to us. Um, so as Jesus makes perfectly clear in Mark, this time is a blessing to you, so appreciate it, and you will experience rest. Um, so I'm just going to pray, and then TJ and Bree are going to come up, and we're going to sing now. Uh, dear Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the blessing that it is. Thank you, Lord, that you have established this pattern throughout, from the very beginning, uh, even in creation, Lord. Uh, thank you that you know what we need, um, and you know that we need to set time apart for you, Lord, uh, that is distinct, that is holy to you. Uh, and Lord, that as we do this, we will as well experience a sense and measure of rest. So thank you that you've established this pattern under the new covenant, which is the meeting on Sunday mornings, the Lord's Day, uh, that we can come, uh, that we can worship you, Lord. We can quiet our hearts, take this time. Uh, we can think on you. Uh, and Lord, as well, we can give you thanks for all that you've done. Uh, we can take, give you thanks for Jesus. Uh, we can break bread together and remember his sacrifice, the reason that we're gathered here together. Uh, so, Lord, Lord um, give us a measure of your spirit. Um, Good morning, let's stand together as we sing. Well, it is good for us to remember as we begin thinking about Sabbath and rest that uh, it is a gift from the Lord and it is actually the Lord who is for us. Therefore, we have nothing to fear we can let go and rest and enjoy the day of Sabbath, not trying to take control, but relying on the Lord. So we won't fear the battle. We won't 
fear the battle, we won't fear the night. We will walk the valley with you by our side. You will go before us, you will lead the way. We have found a refuge, only you can say. Sing with joy. Sing with joy now, our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now, no love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Even when I stumble, even when I fall, even when I turn back, still your love is sure. You will not abandon, you will not forsake. You will cheer me onward with never-ending grace. Sing with joy now, our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now, no love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Hide nor death can separate us. Hell and death will not defeat us. He who gave his son to free us holds us in his love. Let's sing that once more. Neither, neither hide nor death can separate us. Hell and death will not defeat us. He Son to free us, holds us in his love. Sing with joy, sing with joy now. Our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now. No love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? You've 
done great things. Oh, hero, oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great This morning, as we continue singing, uh, we're going to rest in the fact, as we think about Sabbath, that Christ is our Sabbath, that we find our rest in Him and who He is, that He has indeed conquered the grave, that He has indeed set the captives free, He has indeed done great things in our lives. So today, as we marvel, as we worship, let us just sing His praises and confess who He is today through song.
bigger for name. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. We confess that to you today, Lord, that there is none like you. That there is no one who has ever been or ever will be like you, Jesus. We say that about your name. It is great. It is beautiful. It is wonderful. It is glorious. And we are nothing apart from you. Lord, forgive us for the times that we believe we can find pleasure or satisfaction, fulfillment or peace apart from you, Lord. So in this time, we want to just uh, afresh commit our hearts to you. Help us to lay everything down at your feet. In submission to who you are. You are worthy of that today. And that is for our good and our joy as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Good morning again, folks. Um, what a powerful time um, of some worship. And uh, yeah, just may our hearts be filled um, with gladness um, for the remainder of our time together. Um, so good to gather with one another um, this morning. I just wanted to draw each of your attention uh, to everything coming up within the life of the church over the next few weeks. Um, please uh, bear with me. There is a lot happening, um, which is so good. Um, Please have your phones out if you are a digital minded person or your diaries out if you're not um, for some of the things uh, upcoming. Football um, will be on tomorrow night. Um, last week was the first time in a long time uh, that we've had to cancel due to low numbers. Uh, so uh, please, uh, please just be praying that the numbers pick up again this week and um, that we're able to minister to guys in our community um, through the, the art of football and um, that we're able to build connections with, with these guys. Um, and yeah, just for guidance on how we do that. Uh, our usual ESOL outreaches are on Tuesday um, and Wednesday. Uh, please be praying for them and the success that we see through that. Um, we have our, our usual prayer times on Tuesday and Friday. Um, I just encourage you, if you've not connected with any of these times, um, please do so. Um, Abby and I do our best to be there on a Tuesday evening, and we're always encouraged, uh, often arrive very tired uh, but leave so refreshed and um, so i just encourage you if you have the time um, tuesday evening or friday morning uh, please connect to that uh, same with our missional communities um i don't know about you guys but um we've had such a blessed time uh, the past few thursdays um, in our new missional community and um, it's been so good just to meet with one another to share food with one another fellowship grow in relationship with one another um, and open the word to reflect on on what has uh, been preached on the following, um, the, sorry, the, th the Sunday prior. So if you're not connected to a missional community, uh, what some churches might call a home group, um, please speak to Mark or TJ. Um, you'll not regret um, joining one of our groups. Um, some more advanced dates for your diary. This was mentioned last week, but I'm going to mention it again. Um, we have a DBC Life meeting Wednesday the 7th of February from half five until half eight. Um, this is a time where we get to come together as a full church family and um, we eat, shock, because we always eat. Um, <laughs> then we have a church meeting, uh, discuss things that have been happening in the life of the church, things that are going to be happening uh, in the life of the church, God willing. Um, 
and everyone is welcome, both members and non-members, um, and it's always a real uplifting, encouraging time. At closest to the time, Claire will send out a link looking for people to volunteer for drinks, food and drink for that. Um, yes, yeah, so please put that in your diary in advance. Uh, and another, uh, one last advance notice um, and something to be praying for in, in advance is starting Sunday the 18th of February, um, um, the evenings between 6 and 8. For four weeks, the church is going to be starting a 3 to one course. Um, and this is a four-week alpha type course. Uh, the three stand for God, the two stands for the world, and one stands for us, um, as Mark has laid out for me um, and <laughs> we want to be inviting our non-believing uh, friends, family, work colleagues, um, neighbours, um, whoever that may be and there will be a graphic sent out this week um, for you to freely send on to people. Um, everyone is welcome if you feel like to, uh, to come uh, but it is specifically aimed uh, at non-believers and at new believers. Uh, so please be praying ahead of time if that's something that you feel uh, you're called to go to, if it's feel like you're something to go to with a friend, um, or a family member, um, someone, and then pl please feel free. Morning, guys. Yeah, great to see you. Um, during this time, there will there will be coffee and cake to begin with, followed by some videos um, and some time of discussion. So uh, loads happening. It's so encouraging to see so much happening, but I would just uh, we're going to pray just now for some of these things. Um, I'll leave a time of quiet for you to pray in your hearts um, as you feel led, um, and then I'll transition us on to the next uh, part of our prayer. So, yeah, just pray for a minute or so, and I'll close our time. So. Father, um, we're so blessed by all that's happening in the life of the church. Um, thank you for the opportunities that you give us to serve you, um, to serve our community. Uh, we thank you for all the, the gifts, the talents, the abilities, and the time um, that people are able to commit to each and every one of these outreaches that happen week on week, Father. Yeah, just thank you for them. Um, thank you for the way that we can serve our community um, through serving you and what a joy that that brings. Um, yeah, just pray for each and every person involved in each and every one of these ministries that they continue to serve um, out of a love for you um, not out of habit and not out of it's because it's something that's good to do, Father, but out of a, a desire to, to serve you, to tell more people about you. And Father, we look ahead to the, the 3 to one course. I just pray that you lay on our hearts people that we can invite um, and that it can just be such a simple way um, of telling people about you and what you've done in our life, Father, and what you can do in their life. Um, yeah, we ask these things in your name. Amen. Um, and many of us um, within the congregation have been reading through a uh, Bible in a year. Um, I must confess I've got a wee bit behind this week, but that's okay. I'll get caught up. Um, uh, but I've been so challenged and so blessed uh, from it. And in the midst of my own life, in the past few weeks, I've constantly been reflecting upon the life of Joseph, even though we're now in Exodus. Um, and where I want us to just very quickly and very briefly zoom into um, the story of Joseph's life in Genesis is in chapter 39. Um, and at this point in uh, the story of Joseph, um, he's been betrayed by his brothers, almost dead, um, then thrown into a pit, not dead, um, almost going to be dead, brought out the pit, put on a camel, sold to slavery, um, and he once almost dead, um, but still alive. So uh, let's read um, from Genesis 39, um, just a, a short extract from verse 1 through 6. Now Joseph had been taken to Egypt, an Egyptian named Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and the captain of the guards, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had, who had brought him there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, serving in the household of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made everything he did successful, Joseph found favor 
with his master and became his personal attendant. Potiphar also put him in charge of his household and placed all that he owned under his authority. From the time that he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian house with positive safety. The Lord's blessing was on all that he owned in his house and in his fields. He left all that he owned under Joseph's authority. He did not concern concern himself with anything except the food that he ate. And uh, through all that we read in Genesis, Joseph is so clearly uh, protected by God. And something that's really stood out with me throughout the the length of um, Genesis that we actually read about Joseph um, is that he hasn't been protected from circumstances, but he's been protected in circumstances. Let me say that again. He hasn't been protected from circumstances, but he's been protected in uh, in circumstances. And um, so often in our life, because our world tells us to do so, uh, we make it a sad thing for ourselves by asking uh, God constantly to change circumstances, to remove circumstances, to remove us from circumstances, when in fact um, most of the time God seems, um, what God seems to do with his followers, um, his children, is that he doesn't change the circumstances for us, but he changes our attitude towards the circumstances in which we find ourselves. Um, and when we start to pray for victory, uh, and guidance in these circumstances amid some challenge, uh, amid disappointment, um, amid the same people, um, often our experiences begin to change in a way that we see Christ working in all things. Um, and I was so challenged thinking of this, that God could have done so many different things in Joseph's life, uh, but he chose all the events to happen in a specific order uh, to unfold Um, in a perfect way though Joseph at the time I'm sure didn't feel things were unfolding in a perfect way and this was God's will and way uh, for his life Um, so let's just pray just now that in the midst of often trialing circumstances in the midst of uncertainty for many of us um, in the midst of chaos at times that God will mold our hearts and minds uh, to change our attitude towards situations that we're in uh, to give us forgiving hearts when we need to forgive, um, something that we spoke a lot about at Mission Communities on Thursday, and to praise him both when we're feeling on the mountaintop, uh, but in the valley. So I, I, I believe that God will lead you just now um, to pray for a specific situation in your life um, as you feel led to do so um, with in a similar vein. So pray, and then I'll transition into our final part. Father, um, I just pray just now um, as we reflect on uh, the life of Joseph um, that no matter the circumstances and situation uh, that you have placed us in just now, um, I pray that we continue to pray um, for your guidance in these situations. Um, I pray that you help us to see you in these situations, Father. Uh, You have placed us in these situations um, to honor you, uh, to give you glory. you've put us in these situations to test us, to test our faith, Father. So I just pray um, that you equip us and that we continue to rely on you and that in these situations we don't turn from you, but we seek you more, uh, Father. Um, That's our prayer. Uh, We ask these things in your name. Amen. And just finally, there's so much um, that we could unpack from the life of Joseph. Um, But for the sake of time, I just want us to focus in very briefly on on verse 2 and then the response from verse 2 of our passage. Um, The circumstances, the situation for Joseph seemed um, far from ideal, um, but Joseph's response um, was just so amazing. He just reflected Christ um, and all that he did. Um, And and verse 2 just says, the Lord was with Joseph. And just similar vein to what we've just prayed for, uh, Joseph was so aware of the presence of his Lord in his heart um, and his life. And through every single trial, uh, the Lord was with Joseph. Um, What really stood out for me in this part was that Potiphar, uh, verse 3 and beyond, acknowledged 
that he saw that the Lord was with Joseph uh, and that the Lord had blessed his household. Um, the Hebrew slave brought uh, from a pit, bought at auction, uh, radiated Christ and his character um, in one of the most powerful households in the land um, through his confidence, through his honesty, uh, through his comfort and through his continued reliance on God, the character of Christ shone through Joseph. Um, how easy it would have been for Joseph at this point in his life to just throw in the towel, uh, to stop relying on Christ. Um, but he continues to heavily rely on Christ at this in these difficult times to fully sustain him as his strength. Um, so my prayer just now is that we are reminded um, that the Lord is with us, um, not just in good times, the Lord is with us always. Um, and that let's, pr let's pray that the Lord can give us a Joseph-like radiance in our communities um, amongst one another, in our places of work, with our neighbours, with our friends, um, and ultimately, ultimately, um, that he'll be glorified um, through us. Um, so let us pray that in the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of um, trial and consequence, uh, trial and situations, um, that we can have a God-led Joseph-like response. Um, so let's pray for that just now, for, our, for ourselves and for our brothers and sisters. Father, um, thank you for the example um, <coughs> of, of Joseph and thank you for the example that you can use um, us so simply um, to honour you, <coughs> Father. Um, I pray uh, for each and every one of us that this week, um, as we leave what's often the comfort of our church, um, that we can reflect you in all that we do, in all that we think, in all that we say. Father, um, and through our actions, uh, you can be glorified, um, and people are so aware of you working in their lives, just like Potiphar was aware um, of you working in Joseph's life, Father. Um, I pray that through that, that can spur up conversations um, with those that we interact with, Father, um, and that we can be bold when you lead us into these conversations. And uh, finally, Lord, we thank you um, that you've chosen that when your word is preached um, in the power of your spirit that your voice is heard. Um, so, Father, we pray um, now as we, sim as we listen to Mark um, come and preach that we're not just listening to him speak about an ancient book, um, but about the reality um, that you've chosen um, us, broken people, um, Father, and that by the power of your Holy Spirit, um, you can speak to us um, through the word this morning. Um, only you can do it in our lives, Father. We can't do these things on our own. Um, so we ask that you save us, um, that you help us to focus and concentrate this morning. I pray that you get rid of any distraction in our life um, right now. Um, and the same for Mark as he comes um, to preach from your word, Father. We ask all these things in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Uh, it's great for us to, to be in worship together um, and just to really recognise just how good this day is that we can, as Samuel's mentioned uh, and as Neil has mentioned as well, this is a Lord's Day uh, and this is a time where we can just experience God's blessing through the unity of all of us being together. Uh, and this morning we want to continue uh, what is the final part of our Freedom in Christ series. Uh, we've spent time thinking about freedom from lies, uh, freedom from fear, uh, last week, uh, TJ took time to look at freedom from unforgiveness. Uh, this morning, our focus is on a subject that's often overlooked, uh, but one that's vitally important uh, as we think about what it means to live faithfully and fruitfully for Christ. Uh, we're thinking about freedom from shame, freedom from shame. Uh, we're going to begin by reading Hebrews 12 and verses 1 to 2. Um, primarily because this is such an important passage uh, on this subject. Um, this is going to be our starting point, um, but it's also going to be the point that we're going to land on. We're going to focus on Hebrews 12, 
1 to 2 at the end, uh, as we think about what it means to be free from shame. Um, and as we do that, we're also going to be looking at a, num a number of other passages that are going to help us as we come to terms with what shame is and the solution uh, to shame. Uh, my hope and prayer, um, as we think about this subject, recognising this is a difficult subject for us to look at, uh, we can all recognise that today, um, but as we think about shame, um, the more and more we do this, the more and more we would see the power, the beauty, the reality of the gospel uh, for each one of us. That as we think about shame, we would think about the gospel. That's really my heart for us today. So Hebrews 12, starting in verse 1, the writer of Hebrews says this, Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us, let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Father, this is your word, and we come with humility. We come asking that you would speak to us. and We come, Lord, I pray that we would come with repentant hearts, um, but we would come with a recognition that we do so often fall short. But we would also come with an understanding of grace, that your grace is sufficient for us. And your grace is sufficient for us as we spend time focusing on this passage and thinking about what it means to be free from shame. So we ask that by your spirit you would take this time, that you would use it, that you would shape us and mould us according to your glory. Amen. Uh, I don't know what your relationship uh, with shame is like. Uh, there's no doubt we all, from time to time, experience uh, varying degrees uh, of shame in our lives. Uh, and the extent to which uh, this has been a problem in your life, to a greater or lesser degree, it's really something that only you can answer. I, I can't answer that for you. But I think we can all recognize shame as a reality. Uh, I'm fairly confident this morning uh, that as many of us have experienced shame, uh, we've not actually been aware that this is what it is. Uh, there's every chance that shame and its effects have had a tangible reality in our lives, but we've not put that particular label on it. Uh, so this morning, uh, what we're going to do is quite simply divide our time uh, into two parts. We're going to think about the problem of shame, and we're going to think about the solution to shame. The problem of shame and the solution to shame. And as we do that, I really do hope and pray uh, this will aid us in terms of um, as we think about who God has called us to be, um, as God's word speaks to us, God's spirit would minister to us and that we would be strengthened by it. So the problem of shame is our first focus. There's no doubt about it, shame uh, in a particular unrighteous form is a problem. It is a problem for all of us. Uh, and for us to properly identify the problem of shame, we have to define what shame is. Uh, let me share with you something of a, a helpful definition, a starting point for us as we try and define what shame is. Uh, shame is a painful emotion of being sad, embarrassed, or guilty when you believe that something you have done is futile, improper, or immoral. Shame is a painful emotion of being sad, embarrassed, or guilty when you believe that something you have done is futile, improper, or immoral. It's a helpful starting point for us as we take time to understand what shame is, but I would also want to say there is so much more to shame than that definition. Uh, shame has a tendency to dig a lot deeper into the core of who we are, uh, more than any other emotion, and this in turn can have a negative effect upon us. Uh, for us to understand what I mean by this, and for us just to get a better definition of shame, uh, I want us to contrast the difference between shame and guilt. Shame is not guilt. Guilt is not shame. There is a very fine line, but a very important line between guilt and shame. Uh, the difference between these two has huge implications around how it is we function day to day. Uh, if we don't have an accurate understanding of what guilt is and what shame is, then we are going to be messed up in our hearts and minds. Uh, guilt is a feeling we have 
when we believe we have made a mistake. Let me say that again. Guilt is a feeling we have when we believe we made a mistake. Uh, shame is a feeling we have when we believe that we are a mistake. Shame is a feeling we have when we believe we are a mistake. In other words, we don't think the problem is rooted in our actions. We think the problem is rooted in our identity and who we are as individuals. Cultural news site Mashable uh, echoes this and outlines how shame can be understood and defined in this way and also the effect it can have on connections and relationships that we have day to day. So this is an article from Mashable. It says, shame tends to be an isolating feeling. It convinces you that you're repulsively strange or incorrigibly flawed, that no one else could possibly understand you or even want to. Worse, it has a way of feeding into itself making it impossible to even consider reaching out to someone who might get it. Uh, and this is what we see in Scripture as well. Uh, before sin entered the world, we read of the spiritual and emotional state of our first parents, Adam and Eve. In Genesis 2, 25, we're told both the man and his wife were naked, yet felt no shame. They felt no shame. They were naked and they felt no shame. When there's no shame... There's no need to hide anything. No need to cover up. But then, have a look at what we read post-fall. Post the first sin of Adam and Eve in Genesis 3, 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. And they knew they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Sinless Adam and Eve in Genesis 2 were naked and they felt no shame. And they did. And they had no reason to cover up to hide, but sinful Adam and Eve in Genesis 3, they were naked and they felt shame. There's no doubt about it. And they did everything they could to cover up and to hide. So it is with each one of us. If we believe we've sinned, if we then experience shame as a result of our sin, the fruit of that can be some kind of covering up and hiding. Uh, we see it in our culture, we see it uh, in Genesis 3, Gen uh, shame causes us to collapse in on ourselves, to focus on ourselves, and then we actively choose not to reach out to others because we are, by definition, ashamed. So I want us to begin this morning by recognizing that shame is a reality for every single one of us, and as a reality, it is a problem for all of us. It's a reality in our lives. It's a reality in this church. It's a reality in our society. There is an epidemic of shame in our world. Now, as we come to that definition of shame and as we recognize it as a potential problem, uh, I want us to understand this morning that not all shame is bad. Um, there is a shame which is actually righteous and there is a shame which is unrighteous. Uh, John Piper defines these as well-placed shame and misplaced shame. And I think these are definitions which are helpful and useful for us as we think about shame today. So how do we know when our shame is righteous or unrighteous? Uh, how do we know when our shame is well-placed or misplaced? Um, we know which kind of shame it is through the extent to which it dishonors God or honors God. That's how we understand what our shame is, what species of shame it is. Does it honor God or does it dishonor God? In other words, is our shame rooted in a desire and a drive to love God and trust in his promises? Or is our shame rooted in a desire and drive to reject God and to not trust in the promises that we find in his word? Well-placed shame um, is something that arises after we've sinned. So we sin. And well-placed shame uh, results uh, after we have sinned. We come to this realization that we have fallen short of God's holy standard. Uh, we feel it in our gut. We experience the shame of what we've done. And we confess we're a sinner. Um, I would find it difficult to get a more clear-cut example of this than when the prophet uh, Nathan confronts David with his sin of adultery and murder. 
Uh, Nathan shares a parable of a man who had so much, but he stole from this one person who had so little. And David says this, as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die because he has done this thing and shown no pity. And then in, in 2 Samuel 12, verse 7, Nathan's reply to David, you're the guy, you're the man. And look at how David responds in verse 13. I have sinned against the Lord. And the fruit of all of this is Psalm 51, one of my favorite Psalms. David in his sin and in his shame, well-placed shame, he runs to God in repentance. In the first five verses of a psalm, David says this, be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion, blot out my rebellion, completely wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. For I am conscious of my rebellion. My sin is always before me. Against you, you alone, I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. And in verses 10 to 12, God, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. Now, if shame causes you to pray that kind of prayer, it's a good thing. That can only ever be a good thing if you experience shame because of your sin and the spirit of what you pray is similar to Psalm 51 or Psalm 51, then that's a blessing. God is at work in your life. Well-placed shame has driven you to holiness. The Apostle Paul uh, does something similar. He, he writes to the church in Corinth and he also speaks about well-placed shame. And he speaks about how it's something the Corinthians should have. They don't have it, but they should have well-placed shame. And he, and he says this because he longs for them to grow, to be changed through God's Spirit, to become the people that he wants them to be and who God wants them to be. So in, in 1 Corinthians 6, 5, Paul is trying to help the church deal with this internal conflict, and he writes this to these believers. He says, I say this to your shame. I say this to your shame. Can it be there is not one wise person among you who is able to arbitrate between fellow believers? And in 1 Corinthians 15, 33 to 34, Paul, again, He's wanting them to be protected from the outside influences of the world. And knowing that they are falling short in this area, he says this, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Come to your senses and stop sinning. For some people are ignorant about God. I say this to your shame. If you're ignorant about God, I say this to your shame. Well placed shame. So we have two examples of when we should be ashamed when we are not living wisely and when we live in a manner that is outright sinful against God. And in both these instances, we are right to be ashamed. In any instance where we dishonor God, we should in fact be ashamed. And so if that's what well-placed shame is, what is misplaced shame? Uh, and to what extent is this a living problem in our lives day to day? Let me just share three examples of misplaced shame. So these are examples, uh, are perhaps types of shame um, that we go through from time to time. Um, and I think all of us will be able to recognize these kinds of shame in our lives. We can all probably subconsciously just think back to moments where we have experienced one of these examples of misplaced shame um, based on our season or situation that we've been in. So misplaced shame, number one, is when it's when our, our well-placed shame lingers for too long. When our well-placed shame lingers for too long. So we sin in some way. And we experience the shame of the sin we've committed. And that shame was right and correct to have. And for whatever reason, that shame does not shift. Um, it could be we didn't ask God for forgiveness. Or it could be we did ask God for forgiveness. But we didn't believe that God's forgiveness was enough for us 
after our repentance. And so we still carry this shame in our lives. And instead of God's promise of grace and our life looking forward to Christ, with all of his promises, we're instead looking back and we're still dwelling in the past and we're thinking again and again and again about that terrible thing that we did. Misplaced shame can be well-placed shame that lingers for too long because we believe that our sin is too big for God and his grace through the cross. We think that our sin is greater than God's love. We just sang, what a beautiful name. Yeah, we sang that a few moments ago. Um, and in that, there's a line from that song that says, my sin was great, your love was greater. All of us need to hear that this morning. All of us. I want you to take that line to the bank every day. My sin was great. My sin is great today. But your love was and is greater. God's love through the cross is the only solution to your problem of sin. The cross is the only solution. It's the only answer to your problem of sin. God's love is greater than your sin, meaning God is going to conquer all of your sin, all of the ways in which you fall short. Everything you say, do, think, your attitudes, that's the gospel. Jesus, through the cross, has defeated our sin so that we can live in grace. But the problem in our hearts is that we often narrate and sing the opposite to that. So we often say to ourselves, your love was great. We all recognize God's love was great. But we say, my sin was greater. My sin was greater. And that so often happens when our well-placed shame lingers for too long and it runs rampant in our hearts and minds and it becomes misplaced shame. So that's the first thing we need to hold on to. Misplaced shame is when our well-placed shame lingers for, for too long. And misplaced shame is also when we're ashamed of something that honor, honors and glorifies God. Um, we can be ashamed of Jesus. We can be ashamed of the gospel. We can be ashamed of being a Christian. We can be ashamed of the church as it fulfills its Great Commission call. We can be ashamed of anything that might result in God's kingdom advancing. And that might sound strange to you this morning, me saying that. You might struggle to imagine a scenario of being ashamed of God and his work in the world. But when you fear man, when you're worried about what other people think of you for being a Christian, anything is possible. Anything. We can experience shame in all of these ways. Take the example of Peter. Jesus is put on trial. And this is Peter. This is someone that we esteem in the church and are so thankful for. But Peter, before his crucifixion, before Jesus' crucifixion, Matthew tells us that Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard <coughs> And a servant girl approached him and said, you were with Jesus, the Galilean too. But he denied it. Peter denied it in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about. When he, when he had gone out to the gateway, another woman saw him and told those who were there, this man was with Jesus, the Nazarene. And again, he denied it with an oath this time. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there approached and said to Peter, you really are one of them, since your, since your accent gives you away. Then he started to curse and to swear with an oath, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the words that Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. What was happening with Peter? What was going on in Peter's life? Well, he was ashamed of associating with Jesus. So he denies him three times. And the third time he calls down a curse. But notice a shift in his shame here. Peter moves from a misplaced shame to something of a well-placed shame. In verse 75, he went outside and wept bitterly. Peter was ashamed that he was ashamed. He was ashamed that he was ashamed of Jesus. And it led to a change that would completely change his life. So that's the second way in which we can experience misplaced shame. When we're ashamed of something that honors and glorifies God. And finally, 
Misplaced shame is when we feel the shame for something that we didn't do. And there's no doubt about it, this is a more difficult one for us to think about this morning. And that can be a shame for something done against us. Uh, when someone hurts us in some way, we can experience the shame that they did this to us. Or it can be a shame when we believe that it was our fault that something happened. Even though objectively it wasn't our fault in any way whatsoever, we can be completely innocent and we can still think it was us. And as a result, we experience shame. Or it can be a combination of the two. These people can hurt us and they can say, it's your fault that I did this. Perhaps that's something you've heard before. Someone hurt you and said, it's your fault that I did this. This often happens with situations of abuse and it's a means of manipulation. It's a means of control over a person for selfish gain. In the movie, The Lion King, I think most of us have probably seen The Lion King, um, we see a clear example of wrongdoing and it leads to shame and it leads to manipulation. Uh, the Lion King is the cartoon lion version of Shakespeare's Hamlet. Uh, not a lot of people know that, but it is true. Um, and that's not the most important piece of information I'm going to share this morning, but it might come in handy for a quiz one day. Uh, in the Lion King, Scar is the younger brother of the king, Mufasa. Uh, and Scar is deeply jealous of Mufasa, and particularly that Mufasa is king and he's not king. And this is compounded by the fact that if Mufasa dies then he won't be next in line to the throne. His son Simba will be. And so it's his jealousy that drives him to devise a wicked plan to kill Mufasa. And he, he makes it look like it was Simba's fault, eventually killing him as well. That's his plan. And we've all probably seen the film. Uh, we all know what happens. The plan works to near perfection right up until the point of Simba being killed. And it's, it still gets me, it's such a sad scene when Simba realizes his dad is dead and he buries himself under his dad's lifeless paw. But it's at this moment, this is a moment of manipulation. Scar turns up and he says to Simba, what have you done? What have you done? No, he doesn't say, Simba, look what I've done, because he did it. He says, what have you done, Simba? Simba, this was your fault, Scar continues. The king is dead, and if it weren't for you, he'd still be alive. What will your mother think? Scar is telling Simba here, this happened not only because of what you did, but because of who you are. And by bringing his mother into it, he's bringing even more shame into the equation. Shame upon shame upon shame. You've brought shame in yourself. You've brought shame in your whole family. And Simba in his shame runs away. Now, if you want, if you want to know what happens next, it's on Disney Plus, so you can do that. Uh, but this morning, as we think about that example, I don't want us to miss this key point. When it comes to shame, and in particular, misplaced shame, this is all, this is what we have a tendency of doing. Like Simba, we do this. We run away, we hide, we cover up. We do everything we can not to revisit what shameful thing we believe we did and we believe points to who we are as individuals. And you only need to look at the examples of Adam and Eve and Peter to see that this is what we do. You only need to look at your own life and the examples of sin and shame that you've experienced to see that this, this is what we do. We run. We experience shame and we hide. We run. We cover up. This is what Sam Storm says on the problem and effect of shame for the human soul. He says, shame can lead to a variety of emotions and actions. It leads to feelings of being not just unqualified, but disqualified from anything meaningful. People enslaved to shame are constantly apologizing to others for who they are. They feel small, flawed, never good enough. 
They live under the crippling fear of never measuring up, of never pleasing those whose love and respect they desire. This often results in efforts to work harder to compensate for feeling less than everyone else. Shame has innumerable effects on the human soul. Those in shame have a tendency to hide and to create walls of protection to hide their true selves. They are terrified that if they are truly seen and known, they will be rejected by others. So they put on a false face and adopt a personality or certain traits they think others will find acceptable. They are led to be less than they could be, less than they are, and they are deliberately st stifle, and they deliberately stifle whatever strengths they have. They say to themselves, don't ever be vulnerable, it's dangerous. That's shame. That's the, that's the effects of shame. And I think we can all identify this as a problem and reality in our lives. So it's been important for us to think about the problem of shame. I want us now to look at the answer to that problem. Because praise God there is an answer. It's not all negative for us this morning. There is an answer to this problem of shame. So the solution of shame. And I've been struck over the last few weeks in this Freedom in Christ series at how similar the messages have been. Um, and similar in terms of what the conclusion has been to each of these problems. So we thought about each of these problems, each of these challenges and issues, and the answer has always been the same answer. We thought about freedom from lies, freedom from fear, freedom from unforgiveness, freedom from shame today. The answer is always the same. The word of God. God's word is the answer to these problems. Scripture has to be like a cultivated garden in our hearts. If you're someone who longs to see lies, fear, unforgiveness, and shame conquered in your life, then let me ask, how is your relationship with God's word? If you're battling these things and you're finding it difficult to be free from these things, don't focus on these things. How is your relationship with the word of God? There is no other way. God has given us one pathway to conquer all of these issues. Scripture. How is your relationship with the Word of God? This is why I want you to, I want to earnestly encourage you this morning, um, as Samuel mentioned. Our Bible reading plan, we're, we're in January, there's still a long way to go. If you're not already doing so, there's still time to be a part of that. There's something precious and powerful about reading God's word together. To do that as a group of men and as a group of women. And the more and more we delight to do this, the more and more we experience this, I'm utterly convinced, and I know, I'm utterly convinced not only because I see it in scripture, because I've seen it in my own life as well, the more and more we are in God's word together, the more and more we will be protected from every lie and scheme and tactic of the evil one. That's the truth. The word of God is not optional for us. It's your spiritual armor. So put it on every single day. You need it for survival. You will not survive a Christian life if you have this casual, half-hearted, inconsistent relationship with God's word. You will not survive. Put it on. Put on God's word every day. Put it on with the brothers and sisters who sit beside you today. If you want to do that, if you're not a part of what we're doing, join us. This is about survival. And it's about thriving in God as well and being fruitful for him. So speak to me after our time. It takes two seconds for us to sign you up. And, I, and as we take time to read God's word together, we experience a unity with one another, but we experience a unity with God that protects us from our own flesh, from the world, and from Satan and his schemes. God's word is what will free you from every form of shame. And in Mark 5, we read the story of a woman who suffered from bleeding for 12 years. And I want us just now to, to focus on this as we think about God's word. There's no doubt with the type of disease that she had and the fear from those around her, that if they touched her, they would be defiled. This was clearly someone who lived in shame. She lived in shame, cultural shame, relational shame, personal shame, spiritual shame. She was afraid to show her face to others. 
shame to find this woman. But she hears about Jesus. And she hears about how he has a power to transform lives. And she wonders for a moment if this might happen to her. If she touches Jesus, would she be transformed? She asks that question. And so she musters up the courage to look for him. And she says in her heart, if I just touch his clothes, then I'll be made well. So she finds him walking through a crowd. And this is exactly what she does. She gets near to Jesus. She, she touches his robe. And Jesus realizes that power has gone from him. And so she asks the crowd, who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing against you, and yet you say, who touched me? But as he looks around to see who had done this, this woman with fear and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, knowing that she had been instantly healed, came and fell down before him. She tells Jesus everything. And I want us to take note this morning, it is Jesus and only Jesus through his word that can bring about this kind of transformation. We all carry different issues and problems. None of us have the problem that she had, as far as I'm aware. But we all have problems and issues and challenges that can overwhelm us and cause shame. And she touches Jesus and experiences transformation. And we can do the same. We can all do the same. We can all touch Jesus. We can all come to his word and experience renewal. Jesus approaches her and interestingly he tells her three things and I want us to see that this is also true for every single one of us no matter what it is we face today Jesus says three things to this woman firstly he tells her that she was healed of her disease so after 12 years of physical suffering and relational rejection she was healed instantly praise God for that secondly he tells her that she can go in peace she doesn't need to worry about what others think about her her life is free from this debilitating disease and all of its social consequences. And then finally, and most importantly, he calls her daughter. He calls her daughter. So it wasn't just that she was physically healed. She was spiritually healed. She was emotionally healed. She had a new identity. She no longer needed to live in shame. And for all of us who profess faith in Christ today, I want you to understand, Jesus calls you daughter. Jesus calls you son. And it's that new identity. It's only that identity that will allow you to experience freedom from misplaced shame in your heart. So when you realize who it is you now belong to, you belong to Jesus. Your new identity is in him. No weapon formed against you can prosper. No weapon including the weapon of misplaced shame. Never. Your identity is in Christ, so live in that identity because nothing's going to defeat you as you're rooted in Christ and his word. <coughs> this morning, as we reflect on this example of freedom from shame through freedom in Christ, I want to just encourage you to be a people who run to Jesus by running to his word. Be a people who touch Jesus' robe by opening up his word. Be a people who hear Jesus by hearing his word. And be a people who experience a life free from shame as you receive his word. As you take it, you hear it, you take it, you believe it, you live by it. So let God's word shape you. Let it mold you. Let it change you. Let it heal you. As it shaped, molded, changed, and healed the woman of Mark chapter 5. This is the only pathway to a life free from shame. And to all of us here this morning, let me just say, as we close, Jesus gets it. He really does get it. He knows the reality and power of shame himself. He went through every human experience, every human experience that we've been through. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way, including shame, as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 4.15. Now, does that not bring great encouragement to your heart? To know that Jesus understands shame. He gets it. He's not this distant, aloof God 
he met us where we were at. He lived amongst us. He experienced the tangible reality of shame. And he has offered us a way free from shame. In our passage in Hebrews 12, the writer to the Hebrews tells us in verse 2, that Jesus, for the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So Jesus came to experience the height of all pain because of the cross, and he came to experience the depth of all shame because of the cross, and neither would have the last word over his life. And we see from Hebrews, it would be joy and it would be glory that would define him and not shame. Now, the writer to the Hebrews tells us here, not that Jesus overcame shame. It doesn't say that Jesus overcame shame or endured shame or suffered shame. It tells us that Jesus despised shame. He despised shame. It's quite a, a strange phrase. He despised shame. What did that mean for Jesus? What does that mean for us? The fact that Jesus despised shame on the cross. Shame was running rampant on the cross. Shame was everywhere on the cross. Jesus was abandoned. That was shameful. Jesus was mocked. Jesus was rejected. Jesus was beaten. Jesus was stripped naked. Jesus was tortured. Everything about the cross screamed shame and disgrace. And Jesus, his heart response was to despise everything that was shameful on the cross. Why did he do this? Why did he despise shame? And what does that mean for us? If Jesus despised shame on the cross, what does that mean for you and for me? Well, Jesus saw it for what it was. Jesus recognized that this kind of shame was misplaced shame. It served no purpose in his life. No purpose. And so he completely rejected it. And John Piper, speaking of Hebrews 12 too, he describes in a really unique way, he describes what Jesus was going, going through as he despised shame on the cross. And as he described what was going on with him, he uses creative language to describe what Jesus would have said to shame hypothetically as he hung on the cross. And as we close, let me just share what Piper writes. So this is Jesus speaking to shame. And I want us just to use what we, what we hear here as a prayer, as a means from which we can respond to shame and say, you're not going to have the last word. You're not going to have any influence or control over my life. Joy in Christ is what's going to define me. And joy in Christ is what I'm going to live by. So Piper writes this, Jesus speaking to shame. Listen to me, shame. Do you see that joy in front of me? Compared to that, you are less than nothing. You are not worth comparing to that. I despise you. You think that you have power. Compared to the joy before me, you have none. Joy, joy, joy. That is my power, not you, shame. You are worthless. You are powerless. You think you can distract me. I won't even look at you. I have a joy set before me. Why would I look at you? You are ugly and despicable, and you are almost finished. You cover me now as with a shroud. Before you can say so there, I will throw you off like a filthy rag. I will put on my royal robe. You think you are great, because even last night you made my disciples run away. You are a fool, shame. You are, you are a despicable fool. That abandonment, that loneliness, this cross, these tools of yours, they are all my sacred suffering and will save my disciples, not destroy them. You are a fool. Your filthy hands fulfill holy prophecy. Farewell, shame. It is finished. Amen. It's true for all of us. It's true for Christ. It is true for every single one of us. Do you see the implication, Denison Baptist Church? If that's Jesus' response to shame, then you and I who are in Christ, Christ is in us, we can adopt the same attitude of Christ Jesus. And we can, we can all share in that passionate despising of shame. So it's not enough for you and I to come to God's word. We need to come with confidence and courage that God's going to help us in our shame. We need to come 
with a spirit-filled heart that fully and completely despises misplaced shame because you're in Christ. Christ is in you. Nothing else matters. To despise shame is to be like Jesus. Amen? So let me just encourage you, believe that, live like that, encourage other people to live like that as well. It's for your joy and it's for his glory. And they're both connected. As you are joyful, God is glorified. So a life marked by freedom in Christ is a life marked by freedom from shame. So praise God. His mercy is good. And this morning, we just want to give you opportunity to respond. Uh, we're going to give, we're going to respond in a number of ways. And I just recognize if, if you have never made a decision to follow Jesus, let me just ask, what is stopping you from doing that today? If you have never made Jesus Lord of your life, then after your time, TJ and I will be here at the front. We'd be happy to chat to you. As we have coffee and we ha as we have fellowship, there is opportunity to chat and to be prayed for. And we can find a quiet space to pray for you. But as we are here, there's also opportunity to receive prayer. Maybe for something you're going through. Maybe you just feel overwhelmed by something. Maybe you are experiencing shame today. Then do speak with us. Speak with someone you know and trust. And we'll take time to pray for you. This morning, we're also going to respond by worship. We're going to worship through song. We're going to give God thanks that the stranglehold of shame no longer needs to be on us. We're free. Your love was great. My sin was greater. It's true. It's not my sin was great. Your love was greater. It's your love was great. No, sorry. <laughs> Messed that up there. That's not true. Your love was great. My sin was greater. My sin was great. My sin was great. Your love was greater. That's true. Amen. Amen. You just edit that out for YouTube purposes. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. This is a gospel reality for all of us. My sin was great. Your love was greater. This morning we also come to the table. Uh, this table represents how it is we can find victory. And our shame. As we come to this table, we recognize Jesus' perfect sacrifice for each one of us. Uh, as we remember his great love for us by dying for us, it's a moment before we come to the table to also confess, to say, well, I've fallen short in this way. I confess that sin. So before we come to this table, I would invite you just to recognize if there's anything in your life that you're carrying that is not of him, to ask for forgiveness. And he is faithful and just to forgive you of all sin, to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Perhaps this morning you're still unsure about your own faith journey, you're still trying to work it out. We would invite you not to come to the table, but instead to observe it and even to pray and ask that God would be at work in your life. This is for those who love and follow Christ. It was on the night in which he was betrayed that Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink this, do so in remembrance of me. So as we take this bread and as we drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. And the Lord died despising the shame. But I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he is able to guard what has been entrusted to me until that day. Amen. Let's pray. So Father, we, we pray that you would now minister to us as we respond in all these ways. We pray that you would take our time and, and use it. We want your will to be done. We don't want any one of our wills to be done. We, we pray that by your spirit, you would convict us and that you would help us to see that, that your grace is sufficient for us, that your power has been made perfect in our weakness and that we can be men and women free from shame we ask you now, work in and through us as we respond. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thanks.
want you to stand with us. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Since they are many, His mercy is more. Let's sing that again. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. What love, what love could remember no wrongs we had done. Omniscient, all-knowing, a God's not there, some thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Sing this, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. What Father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath the debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, his mercy is more. for 
to reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our Savior died. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God. That stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe. For the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, and the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Praise the Father. Praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King. Praise forever. Yes, praise forever to the King. Yes, we praise forever to the King of Kings. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing. I was breathing, but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. was my dream till I met you. You called my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. You called She has saved my soul. Now your freedom is all I know. The old may do. Jesus, when I met you, you called my name. You called my name. You 
My sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future. My eyes are open, cause when you caught my name, I ran out of that grave. One more time, out of, out of the darkness, into your glorious day, you called my name. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. Yes, Father, thank you for the love of Christ that was poured out upon us. That chains have been broken. Shame is no more. But now we are accepted. We are adopted. We are chosen, loved. We are approved. We've been given an inheritance. We are no longer that identity of shame, Lord. Your love was greater than my sin, than my shame. Help us to walk in that freedom and that truth this week as we go into this world, go into our lives, our jobs, our routines, our schools. Help us to live with this sense of identity and freedom, to persevere in that truth this week. Send us out now, Lord, as we go. We love you. Thank you for the joy of experiencing this this morning with church family, for singing these songs together, praying together, being in the word together. That is a gift, and we are so grateful. Thank you for our church family today. Send us out now as we go. In Jesus' name, amen.